Hey guys, welcome to episode 9 of Throwback Thursday, where I talk about old albums that are 20 plus years old that I like, um, not necessarily critically acclaimed albums or best-selling albums, though some of them will be, just ones I like to listen to, so I'm going to review them and hopefully... Maybe some of you will find these by watching these videos. All right. This week, I'm going to do an album by The Clash. Now, The Clash is one of the most influential bands of all time, especially in the genre of punk, but not, not just limited to that. They started out in the 70s. When punk started out, there was... Bands like the New York Dolls, there was Iggy and the Stooges, there was The Clash, there was The Ramones, there was Sex Pistols, The Misfits a little later, um, and then it went into the early 80s, a whole bunch of other punk bands. But The the Clash were different than other punk bands. They, they delved into other styles of music sometimes. They would do a little reggae, which I like their reggae stuff, but... I am not a fan of reggae at all. <laughs> you hear one reggae song, you hear them all. But, yeah, they were... Something about The Clash, they, they, were, they were different than the other punk bands. And it's hard to really say how. They are very political, but they weren't the only political punk band. It's hard to say what separated them from the rest of the punk bands. I'm not saying they're the best punk band, though they might be. I wouldn't, I don't know if my opinion would be they're the best punk band. But they're definitely on a different level than the other punk bands. And I want to re review a Clash album. So I went through trying to figure out which one I wanted to review. I could have done London Calling, but everyone does London Calling. And for good reason, it's an amazing album. The Sandinista. Combat Rock, the, the list goes on and on. But I decided to focus on their debut album, the eponymous album just called The Clash, which was released on April 8th, 1977. Now, this could be a little long. I've. That's my ninth Throwback Thursday episode, and I have never taken as many notes as I have for one of these reviews as I did for this. There's like this. I don't know if you can see it. There's all that. There's another page. And there's another page. Crazy. The Clash. Lots of, lots of stuff about The Clash. Lots of inter interesting things about The Clash and their songs. So I tried to condense it, believe it or not, into this. So it was released on April 8th, 1977 in the UK. It wouldn't come out till 1979 in the US. And when they released it in the US, they cut a whole bunch of songs from the UK album. Didn't put them on the American album and then added a bunch of singles from the UK and put them on the American version, if you can follow that. It used to happen all the time. It was kind of, wasn't done that much anymore by the time this album was released. It was done a lot in the 60s. Bands like the the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they used to have their British albums. They were all cut up and for American consumption. But, so yeah, released on April 8th, 1977. It was recorded over three weeks, three weeks, in February 1977. Um, it just shows you, um, you don't need to spend years in the studio to record an album. To record a classic, influential album like this, three week, three weekends, not even three weeks. They went one weekend and then went two more weekends. So it's six days they recorded this album. Um, the front cover was by the artist Roslaw Zybo. And it's, it's an interesting cover, that's why I'm getting into the cover. The front photo didn't feature the drummer, who was a member at the time, but
but had already decided to leave. So I don't know what that was all about. And there's a picture of the police on the back that was taken during, taken during the Notting Hill Carnival riot in 1976. Um, the song was inspiration for a bunch of stuff they did, including the song White Riot. This is the, a single off this album. Um, yeah. Um, Joe Strummer, the singer, the rhythm guitar player, one of the greatest musicians in the history of the world, in my opinion. I think he was at the Notting Hill Carnival Riot. He was at the Carnival when the riot occurred with the bass player, I forget his name, and it influenced a bunch of the songs. Not a bunch of the songs, but it influenced this album in general, really. Um, especially White Riot. Now, this came out in 77. There was... 77 was also the year of the second Ramones album, Leave Home. I believe it was the year... It was either this year, 76 or 78. There was that gap there. Those three years were like... Like two or three Ramones albums came out. The Clash album came out. Um, two Clash albums, I think. And... The Sex Pistols album came out. Never mind the bollocks. So this was a huge time for punk music. And this is pretty popular in the UK. It it was a very important album. I can't stress that enough. It's find a punk band today that doesn't love this album. If you do, they're not a punk band. That's all I gotta say. So, I'm going to get into the songs now. Sorry for delaying that. Just wanted to emphasize what the song means to people. I listen to this album all the time. I love it. Okay, number one, Janie Jones. Written about a famous brothel keeper in London at the time. It was released as a single and reached number 17 in the United Kingdom. This is a classic class song. I absolutely love this song. It's one of my favorite class songs of all time. It's like two minutes long. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a great thing about punk. They can condense all these songs into these two-minute things, and they're just fucking amazing. And you don't have to wait so long for the next song. You can listen to a bunch of songs right in a row. I wish I could have seen these bands live. I know there's still punk bands around, but not these punk bands. Number two, Remote Control. It was a, a song written against oppression and conformity. It includes observations about bureaucrats, police, big business, record companies. Um, they pretty much disowned the song, Remote Control, after the record company decided to release it as a single without them knowing or approving. So what they did was not play the song live. So they didn't promote their, their own single, which is pretty badass. It's just showed it wasn't about the money, not at the time at least. And it's it's that reference in a lot in another song. This whole thing with the record company was referenced in a later song called Complete Control, which was a single in the UK, like I said, and was recycled and used on the when they re released the this album for the US. And it's a great song. Remote control, I mean, yeah, remote control and complete control. It's confusing. Those two songs are both great. Complete control is the one that was a single, and remote control is on the album. Okay, number three, I'm so bored with the USA. It's originally titled I'm So Bored with You, and it's originally about Mick Jones, the guitar player's girlfriend. And they changed the title to I'm So Bored with the USA. So when Mick Jones played it for Pete, Pete. Joe Strummer, when Mick Jones played it for Joe Strummer, Joe Strummer misheard him and thought he said, I'm so bored with the USA, so they decided to change it to, I'm so bored with the USA. And it condemns lots of aspects of American society, including drug problems in the army, government support of dictatorships in third world, third world countries, still goes on. Um... The army, government, 
TV shows stars like Starsky and Hutch and Kojak, which seems a little less important. And Nixon and the whole Watergate scandal. This is it's covered in the song. Um, some British people look have a lot of the punks at the time, the British ones, used to sing a lot about stuff going on in America. And that, this is one of them, and it's a really, really good song. Number four, White Riot, which was, this was the first single The Clash ever recorded. And it is, it is a great song. <laughs> it reached number 38 in the UK. It was written right after the Notting Hill Festival Riot, which is what I was talking about earlier. And it's a song about, it's a really intense song. It's about class, economic, and, and racial, um, what did I write? Class, economic, social, and, and racial problems. And the song, because it's called White Riot, um, people thought, there's some people that thought it was about starting a race war. They wanted to, like, they were advocating a race war. And they weren't. <laughs> it's actually about, Joe Stormer says it's about white use, him wanting white use to find something um worthy to riot about. He felt that black black youths had something worthy to riot about with racism and everything. And he didn't understand why a lot of these white kids were rioting. So that's what the song's about. It's not about a race war. The Clash don't want to start a race war. Okay. Number five. Hate and War. It's Hate and War. They just took the hippies from the 60s, peace and love, love and peace, they just reversed it, hate and war. It's a contrast of the hope of the 60s and the grim reality of 70s London. It's about everyday working class life in London and a call to toughen up to survive the mean streets. It kind of, it, it uses some racist terms in this, like WAP, which me being Italian, I've definitely heard that one before, and it, it does bother me. Guinea doesn't really bother me, but WAP does. And kebab Greeks were used. I, I've i never heard that before. I'm assuming if you're Greek, you find that offensive. And, um, yeah, those, those lyrics were used in the song, but they were representative of how people in London thought at the time, like kids in London. Um... Again, not a racist song. Good song. Number five, Hate and War. Number six, What's My Name? It's the only writing credit for guitarist Keith Levine, I think is how you pronounce it, um, who left before this band was, I mean, before the album was released. And he actually claims credit for having a lot to do with the sound on the first album. The, the band disputes it. Um... But who knows for sure? Um, he was fired for drug use. And I'm sure the other ones did drugs too, but his drug use was above and beyond and affected his ability to perform with the band and record with the band. So they got rid of him, which is understandable. And it's a, it's a, it's a look at the, the song's a look at the rejection and domestic violence and the personal the personalization it's called what's my name trying to figure out who you are not really knowing who you are trying to figure it out so I got a lot of notes on these songs trying to sort them off there's there's so much about all these songs it's the clash people love the clash so they have opinions about these songs and people write about what they're about all right number seven deny it's originally written by Mick Jones for a band called SS, which was The Clash. It was The Clash before it was The Clash. It was The Clash before Joe Strummer joined and they changed the name to The Clash. And it's about denial in all its forms, about having severe problems with a drug addict. Like, And people think this is about Nick Jones' girlfriend at the time, too, who was a drug addict. And just... His problems with drug abuse, his problems with drug abuse, and his problems with people 
he has to deal with that are drug addicts. And I guess it was influenced by Liar by the Sex Pistols, which came out around the same time on the Sex Pistols only album. Never mind the bollocks. Okay, number eight, London's Burning. I believe this was the B side of um, White Riot. I could be wrong. I think it was the B side, and it's just as good as White Riot. It talks about London's traffic keeping people stuck in their cars until nightfall. That's totally insane. And feeling bored and far from home. There's some racial stuff in there. And the name comes from a nursery rhyme about the Great Fire of London that happened in long 1600 and something. Yeah, London's Burning is a really good song. There's a really good live version. I'm not sure which one it is on YouTube. It's just amazing. I love London's Burning. All right, nine, career opportunities. It's about a political and economic situation in England. The lack of jobs. And when there was jobs, jobs that nobody wanted. Like, it wasn't good. Employment was not good at the time. And it's mainly about the youth. The youth not being able to find jobs that they should have. And, like, there's a line in it that said, I won't open letter bombs for you. This is a job Mick Jones, the guitar player, actually had. Where he would open packages sent to the government to make sure they weren't rigged with bombs. It's not a job I would want. It's Career Opportunities. It's a really good song. It's just, this whole album's full, and their discography really is full of really good songs. Number 10, Cheat. This was a song that was dropped when the album was re released in America in 1979. It celebrates the punk movement that bands like The Clash were pioneering at the time. The Clash, The Ramones, The Sex Pistols, all those bands. It's about nonconformity and breaking the rules. The lyrics are inspired by King Mob. It's, it's a situationalist splinter group in London, I guess. It's inspired by that group. And it's about drug use. There's a lot of drug use in the song. So their songs, they cover so many things. It's, it's hard to just say exactly what the song's about. Just one thing. And the Joseph Drummer didn't like the song. He described it as a filler track. It's a pretty good filler track, if you ask me. Kind of reminds me of John Lennon talking about all these Beatles songs he hates that are just fillers. and They're all great. <laughs> Alright, Protex Blue was a song written just before Strummer, Joe Strummer joined. And it, it's a condom brand. <laughs> I guess they used to have condom machines in the pubs in England at the time. And the brand was Protex Blue. And it, the song's about a guy getting a condom in a bathroom and deciding what he's going to do with it. He's going to have sex with some woman or he's just going to jerk off, I guess. And, yeah, weird song. <laughs> weird topic for a song. Good song. And I guess it was the opening song of their first ever show. So the first song The Clash ever played live was this song. Pretty awesome. Okay, number 12, Police and Thieves. It's a reggae cover that they did by this guy, Junior Martin, which was, it was released the year before this was. And the original became a hit in the UK after the Notting Hill Festival riot. It, it keeps coming up. And Strum, like I said, Joe Strummer was there and Paul Simonon, Simonon, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He was the bass player. They were both there, and the song getting popular inspired The Clash to cover it because of the whole riot. And Joe Strummer changed one of the lines in the song to say they're going through a tight wind. Going through a tight wind, which is a line from the Ramones, but Screak Bop. It was done as a tribute to the Ramones, which is awesome. They were friends. Thirteen. 48 Hours. The song was written very quickly. Um, Mick Jones actually 
like jokes around and says it was written in 48 minutes. <laughs> so they didn't put a lot into the song. It refers to the weekend, 48 hours, you know, Saturday, Sunday. And the feeling of youth desperation to have as much fun as possible before the work week begins again. What they like to call jail on wheels. The work week. Can't really argue with that. Yeah, it's about trying to cram in as much fun into the weekend as you can. 14. Garage Land. Now this was written as a response to a music journalist, Charles Shar Murray, who said of The Clash, and I quote, the kind of garage band who should be returned to the garage immediately. I bet he feels real stupid now if he's still alive. <laughs> um, this is on dedicated to the fans, and they're basically promising the fans in this song that once they signed and made this major contract, record contract, they were going to stay the same. All right, so that's all the songs on the British version of the album. I'll tell you the songs that were removed from this album and the songs that were, when they re-released it in America in 1979, the songs that were taken off the British one and not put on the American one, and the songs that replaced those songs that they took. Okay, they removed the songs Deny, Cheat, Protex Blue, 48 Hours, and the album version of White Riot. And on the American one, they, instead of those songs, they had Clash City Rockers, which was a single in the United Kingdom. Complete Control, which was also a single. The single version of White Riot. Um, yeah, White Man and Hammersmith, Hammersmith Plays. I don't know how to pronounce it. That was also a single in the UK. I Fought the Law, which is a Bobby Fuller 4 cover. And it was released on an EP in the UK called The Cost of Living. And with a jail guitar doors, which was a, a B-side to the Class City Rockers in the UK. So, you got all that out. This is a rough review to do. <laughs> There's just so much about these songs, but I had an excuse, like, to listen to this album over and over again to be prepared for it and like I need an excuse to listen to The Clash. You don't ever need an excuse to listen to The Clash. It's one of the greatest bands of all time. If you like punk music or if you just like punk music, pop punk music now and want to know who influenced these bands or who influenced the bands before those bands, listen to The Clash. Um, Lots of politics in this too. It's smart, smart music, smart lyrics. It's punk. It's great. I know you've heard of The Clash. You've heard Rock the Casbah, I'm sure. Great band. I can't say enough about The Clash. All right, go check them out. And if you do check them out, check out their first album. And check out any of their albums. They're all good. All right, have a great day, guys. See you later.